all right. The key is to do it with grace and not uh, condemnation. So uh, before we dive into the word this morning, good morning. Good to see you guys. Uh, looking forward to spending time with uh, hopefully all of you at the park today. We're going to do a lot of cool things out there and uh, really just hang together. And uh, we got to take advantage of this amazing Arizona weather. Amen. Uh, and the park is really easy to get to. Just go down Alma School, south a mile to Erie, make a right, park's on your left. So it's, it's not that difficult. So, uh, and if you end up in like Gold Canyon, it's not our fault, all right? So um, uh, before we dive into the word, I uh, have a, uh, a wonderful thing to share with you this morning. So every year, uh, we look for just the next kind of batch of leaders to just help minister to the church, to help just bless you guys and bless me and... Uh, there are men and women that are uh, that God is raising up through the ranks of our, our community, and uh, you need to know that when it comes to leadership, it's not just me. Amen. Uh, I I have surrounded myself with men and women that uh, I just love to just partner with in ministry. That I get to speak into their lives, they get to speak into my life, and uh, and it takes a village, right? And it's it's men and women just poised in position to love you with the love of, of Jesus. And in, in Missio Day, we call those leaders uh, deacons and elders. Uh, elders are, are men who just oversee the, the work of pastoring the flock of, of God. And what a pastor and elder does is cares for the sheep, protects the sheep, teaches the sheep, feeds the sheep, just does whatever they can to make sure that the, the flock is healthy. Uh, what deacons do, uh, they are men and women that come alongside the pastors and the elders to make sure that the work of the ministry, the vision gets done. And so the pastors and elders may set the destination of, of the bus, but it's the deacons that make sure the bus gets to the destination. You like that? So uh, we have currently about 10 deacons, elders here at Missio Day. We meet once a month uh, to talk uh, about the ministry, to pray through um, all the households that are represented here, uh, it is truly a great honor to be able to pastor you and to be able to pray for you. And that's why some of you, if you get a call from an unknown number and they're saying you're, they're a, you're deacon, that's who that is. All right. So you, you probably go to go to voicemail every single time. And I know you do because I have the leader send back there go, I've never talked to this person. I always get their voicemail and I leave a message. Well, if you get a call once a month from a deacon, that, that's intentional. That's not a sales call. That's not someone trying to bilk you of, of thousands of dollars. That is someone that is representative of the church that is helping me be the arms and heart and eyes and ears of the ministry. So next time that person calls you, pick it up because I'd love to chat with you. And then I don't have to deal with counseling because they feel so heartbroken that you never want to talk to them, right? So... Uh, they never want to talk to me, you know? Uh, so, and, and on the other hand, if you're not getting a call from somebody, I need to know that because we probably have your name on the list and probably have some wrong number. And so some woman is getting a call that she's like, I have no idea who this is. They call me once a month. She lives in Annapolis, Maryland. You know, you just don't know. So if you're not getting a call, that means we don't have correct information for you. Use the communication card for that. Cool. So, with that said, I've got a new batch of leaders that we've met with, and I want, to, uh, I want to bring them up at this time, because here's the part that involves you. We've done what we believe is everything we can do to make sure that these people are qualified to serve as leaders in the church. Now, with us doing that doesn't mean we've, we've uncovered every stone, you know? That means maybe we don't know of something that we should know about so I'm going to bring three people up here right now that we believe are qualified. Now, what I do is as I share these people with you, you may know something about them that we need to know that we don't know. Uh, it is your responsibility as the church family, church community to let me know of, of a reason you're thinking that person should not serve as a leader at this church, and here's why. Um, but here's the, here's the thing. It's never happened. It's never come back to like, you know, did you know that that person's a serial killer? No, I did not know this. You know, that just escaped our, our investigation into their lives, right? No, we, we love these people. They have gone through a, uh, a multi-month training time where we've read through books. We've prayed together. We've talked. 
Uh, they serve in different areas of the ministry. They just have a heart for Jesus, and they have a heart for the church. And so I'm going to invite Brenda Dahl up here. I'm, I'm going to invite Kelly Tomes up here. I'm going to invite John Pittman up here. So just so you guys know, that's never happened before. People have never applauded people coming up here. So either they're celebrating the sheep going to the slaughter or they, or they really appreciate you guys and love you. So um, here's what's cool. So we're presenting them to you as a church and we're saying, you know what, they, they have our vote of confidence and we would love for them to come on board and serve as deacons here at Missio Day, and just to help love the church. And so we've spent some good time together, haven't we? So we've met, we've talked, we've prayed, we've read books, and just I just appreciate each and every one of you. So Kelly, John, and Brenda, and uh, many of you probably already know them, and you're thinking this is a no-brainer. Uh, some of you may not know them, and yet I just encourage you to get to know them because these are, these are wonderful people up here. So... Uh, what you have as a church is two weeks to let me know of why they should not serve as a deacon here at Missio Day. Um, if I don't, if, I know, this will be the longest two weeks of your life. Um, and in two weeks, if, if I don't hear anything from the church community, uh, we will, and here's a good old Baptist word, we will install them as leaders. Um, and then they'll be a part of the leadership team of just help minister, minister to the church. And so uh, I present them to you, um, and the leaders uh, have their vote of confidence. Now we just want to hear from you as the church community. So we don't vote here at Missio Day. We don't show a raise of hand, you know, show a raise of hands, yay, nay. We don't do any of that. We just, uh, we just move forward by consensus, and we just believe that this is what the direction God's leading us. So if you would with me, let's pray. For these three and then in two weeks we will invite the leadership team up and we'll pray for them and install them officially into positions of of uh of deacons here at, at missio day does that sound like a good plan let's pray father thank you for this morning thank you for john and kelly and, and brenda appreciate their heart um, for you their desire to honor you in their lives and their desire to serve the church it is a wonderful wonderful thing to be involved in the areas of leadership when it comes to your, your kingdom work and the message of, of Christ. And I just think, I'm so thankful for their time that they've committed to this process so far. And I'm excited for the, the journey ahead, Lord. I, I'm excited for how you're not only going to teach them, but minister through them so that the body can be enriched and equipped and mobilized for, for, for great service. So, Lord, uh, be glorified in this time and give us wisdom and discernment as we look at this last piece of bringing them on board as, as leaders. So, Lord, uh, thank you for your church. Thank you for raising up men and women to help lead the church. And we are just so grateful to be a part of it. Bless these three as they go forth doing your will, seeking to bring you glory. And I pray, Lord, that they, they continue to keep their eyes fixed upon you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Give them a hand if you would. It is, uh, it is really through uh, just a, a process and prayer that we meet and talk and just go, all right, God, we're just sensing you're your leading here and just so grateful for you guys. So thank you. So turn to uh, 1 John chapter 5. Two weeks left. Two weeks left. So um, hopefully you've enjoyed the journey in first John. Hopefully you've been encouraged. Hopefully you've been, in, you've been challenged. And, uh, John has some amazing things to say in this last section of his letter to the early church. So turn to first John chapter five. Um, who's, who's a fan of courtroom dramas? Who loves courtroom dramas? I mean, uh, there's a reason why there's guys like Grisham who sell millions of books, right? Because there's a way he writes these incredible thrillers that usually involve the legal system. And, you know, I'm not one for books, but I love courtroom dramas and movies. And I'm going to tell you right now, My Cousin Vinny doesn't count as a courtroom drama, all right? I'm just putting that out there, all right? Even though Joe Pesci would be a phenomenal lawyer representing you, would he not? So courtroom dramas, I mean, some of the classics, there's, there's one called Twelve Angry Men, if you've never seen 12 Hangry Men, see it because here's a courtroom drama with its aim to show 
how you are a prejudiced person. You may not think you're prejudiced, but all of us have prejudices inside of us. Twelve Angry Men. How about Inherit the Wind? Anyone ever heard of Inherit the Wind? This is the true story of the Scopes Monkey Trial, where really it's a battle between creationism and evolutionism. And so uh, great courtroom drama. Now fast forward a few years. Uh, there's a great movie with Edward Norton called Primal Fear, if you didn't see that, dealing with multiple personalities. Scary, thrilling, yes. Perhaps one of the most famous courtroom dramas, uh, A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth, right? That is like a, a, a phrase that will just go down in history, right? Um, there's something about the legal process. There's something about uh, the prosecution and the defense. There's something about well-articulated arguments. There's something about a, a judge that presides over a jury in a courtroom setting and, and, and who's guilty and who's innocent. And, and I'm going to tell you right now that today we get the opportunity to enter into God's courtroom where he is going to present an argument for Jesus and why you should believe in Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, the witnesses that God will bring to the stand in his courtroom this morning, I believe are so good that you would be crazy not to believe that Jesus was who he said he was, that he did what he said he was going to do, and that he alone offers the path to eternal life. Amen? So we're here this morning to enter God's courtroom. And I'm going to tell you right now that the witnesses that God will call to the stand and the evidence that will lie before us is irrefutable. Even though there was an atheist some hundred years ago by the name of Bertrand Russell, he wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian. And Bertrand Russell was a wise thinker who postulated his thoughts of why Christianity was incredible. Why the Bible should not be trusted, and really Christianity is a barbaric, hypocritical religion. So he published this book, Why I'm Not a Christian. Well, shortly after publishing the book, in 1927, Bertrand Russell was approached by someone and asked this question. They asked him, Mr. Russell, if you found yourself standing before God, what would you say to him? Russell answered, I probably would ask, sir, why did you not give me better evidence? And yet, history is filled with men like Russell, women like Russell, who are demanding more. And I'm going to tell you something right now. That I had a grandfather who died an atheist. I had a grandfather that was vehemently against God. So much so when my family was changed by the love of Jesus Christ, he called, he wrote letters dismissing the, the factual evidence, dismissing the, the truth claims of Jesus. So much so it brought my parents to tears because he tried everything he could to undermine their faith. And I remember sitting before my grandfather on numerous occasions. Why do you not believe? And he said, Jesus could come down right now and stand in front of me. And you know, then I might believe. And I sit there and go, Grandpa, he's already done that. He's already made himself known. See, the issue is not evidence. You know what the issue is? Write this word down. Unbelief. Un unbelief is so wicked, so deceptive, so deceitful, so dangerous. We don't live in a world that lacks evidence. We live with hearts that are unbelieving. That's the issue. And honestly, if you ever get into a, a, a debate, an argument, a dialogue with someone about the existence of God or the, the veracity of Jesus and they want more and more evidence, that is just an unbroken conversation. It's like a dog chasing his tail around like this. Because the real issue is not evidence. The real issue is unbelief that dwells within our hearts, that we refuse deliberately to see what is right there in front of our eyes. As John will present to us this morning, the evidence is irrefutable. The witnesses will testify to that. 
Look at 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 6. We read these words. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with water only, but with water and with the blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that bear witness, the spirit, the water, the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness of God is this, that he has borne witness concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. And the one who does not believe God has made God to be a liar because he has not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning his son. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has not the son has, who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Here's the the, the big idea of, of John's letter, is that he wants every person who believes in Jesus to know, i.e. have certainty, have confidence, have assurance. What John has written in, in his letter is meant to bolster your faith, not break it down. He's given you a solid foundation in which you, you can reasonably and logically believe the truth claims that he's putting forth. And notice how many times he uses the word witness here. He is basically bringing this idea that these things are verifiable, these things are factual, the evidence is irrefutable. And there's three things we need to talk about as we examine the evidence, as we look at these witnesses. The first is this. There's evidence and history. One of the things that I just considered a joy to talk about is the historical veracity of Christianity. You know, it's one thing to feel strongly about something, but your faith is not solely based on your feelings. Feelings and emotions and experiences are important, but they're not the penultimate thing when it comes to believing in Jesus. That the, the historical evidence, the objective evidence, facts are something to be discussed and something that should encourage us so check this out there's two things we need to talk about that john sets forth in verse six he says and this is the one who has come by water not by water only but also by blood so he uses two image two pictures water and blood which tell us something about the ministry of christ number one water which was the thing that uh, basically consecrated Jesus' mission. So his mission is consecrated. And number two, blood, Jesus' mission is consummated. So two good words to get us started this morning in our discussion. Water and blood. Water, Jesus' mission consecrated, started, inaugurated. And then secondly, his blood, which is his mission consummated. What these these two truths communicate to us is this. Jesus' baptism and Jesus' crucifixion. In all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have all of them telling us about Jesus' baptism and all of us telling us about Jesus' crucifixion. Why is this important? Well, in John's day, 2,000 years ago, there was this false teaching going around the, the church and the community basically saying that Jesus was a mere man, that at his baptism, the Christ Spirit came upon him, lived his life, and then when he was crucified, the Christ Spirit disappeared. So only between these two events was the Christ Spirit truly with this man, Jesus, but that is against orthodox belief. That is against what we believe the Bible teaches. What we believe is that Jesus was 100% human, but also 100% God, and there was never a divorce of those two ideas. 
He came into the world as the the God-man. He dwelt among us, fully God, fully human. But what was interesting about the baptism of Jesus, he was baptized by who? John the... It seems appropriate to have that title, right? John the Baptist, what do you do? I baptize people. Well, good. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And here is... Now, imagine the job of baptizing Jesus, right? I mean... Wasn't he also humbled by this? He says, I'm not worthy to to even tie the sandals of Jesus. And yet here Jesus comes and John uh, the Baptist declares, Behold the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world, right? Here comes Jesus down to the Jordan to be baptized by John. You can read about this more in Matthew chapter 3. And John baptizes Jesus. Why was it important for Jesus to be baptized? Now, what we believe about baptism is you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Even though we strongly encourage it as a sign of saying, I'm associated with Jesus, I'm a disciple of Jesus, you do not have to be baptized to be saved. Though, we do have moments where we do dunk people for Jesus, and you've never been dunked for Jesus, we hope you do it someday. Amen? Another topic for another time, all right? But Jesus is uh, associating himself with baptism. Why? Because the baptism John did is called a baptism of repentance. Now, the question is, did Jesus need to repent of anything? Did he need to, to have a change of heart or change of mind about something? No. But what Jesus was doing at this inaugural event of his public ministry was this. He was identifying with us as humans. Here's a God who doesn't love us humans from a distance, but he's a God who dwells among us. This is awesome. Holy divinity encased in very real humanity so that he could dwell with us. And so what he does is he says, I will identify with you and be baptized along with you, not because I need to be baptized, because I want to be identified with you as a human being. This is the start of Jesus' ministry. That's why John says that is important, because now here's the public declaration that Jesus' ministry will begin. Ultimately, then, we go to the opposite end of his three-plus-year ministry to the event that consummated the work that Christ had come to do, the crucifixion. This is why the cross of Christ is important in our discussions. See, not only that Jesus was baptized, but everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did pointed to the reason he came. He came to die so that we who were dead in our sins could be alive in him through his death. Wow, that's a that's a mouthful of theology right there. But it's the most glorious theology I could share with you because you have to understand the crucifixion of Christ is where our sinfulness and God's holiness meet. It's where our sinfulness and God's justice intersect. You cannot talk about Jesus without talking about the cross. If there's no cross, then you emasculate the work of Jesus and Jesus is nothing but a pure moral philosopher philosopher and he's really not god incarnate this is why john is speaking this truth to the early church and i'm speaking it to you today because there's a battle against jesus out there there's a battle against jesus because there's people that will decry you know what he he wasn't who he said he was he didn't do what he claimed to do yeah he's a good moral teacher he's a great philosopher but let's just keep him at that and you cannot keep him at that Because you don't say the things Jesus said, you don't do the things Jesus did unless he was who he claimed to be, and that was God who came to take away the sins of the world. Lewis, C.S. Lewis framed it this way, he's either a lunatic or he's a liar or he's Lord. They're your options. What are you going to choose? Because you don't say the things Jesus said and have the integrity Jesus had and be a liar. You don't love with compassion and grace and kindness and end up being a lunatic well, then the third option is the only reasonable option. He is Lord. Let me tell you something interesting that happened yesterday. So last Sunday, tragic event happened in Texas with the shooting of those people at, at church. And w- my wife texted me after we were done, and I'm sitting there going, oh, 
you know, number one, I, I grieve for those families. I grieve for that church. I grieve for that community. You know, you sit there and go, you know, you've, you've got church in Texas. You've got a concert in Las Vegas. You've got a gay nightclub in Florida. It doesn't matter who you are. Evil and suffering is an equal opportunity employer. Right after that Texas shooting happened, I had an atheist friend that I used to work with at FedEx message me on Facebook, and he called me out. Scott Morgan, how do you respond to this question? If God's so good, why do evil and suffering happen? How would you like that question? Who wants to come up here and, and, and articulate the, 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 the fine argument that is involved with that very difficult question and has not history been filled with men and women who have asked them that, that same question. If God is so good, if He's so loving, if He's so kind, why is there evil and suffering? So I responded to my friend via Facebook. I said, this is more than a Facebook messenger chat. This is worthy of a face-to-face -face conversation. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've been trying to meet with this guy one-on-one -on -one for years. He said, I'd love to. My family's out of town this weekend. Let's do it. I said, how about we meet at Sozo at 2 o'clock? And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Just, just wait. Friday night, he's going to be like, can't do it. Saturday morning, can't make it. So I confirmed with him Saturday morning. Are we still on? He said, yes. 2 o'clock, he and I meet out there on the patio. And we have the most spirited conversation. And what I love about what God did at that moment, I told my wife after, I said, I've, there was a, there's just, throughout the conversation, I just felt like God's spirit was just giving me the things I needed to say and share. And we were having just a very loving, compassionate back and forth. And here's a guy who all the time is p posting things about atheism on his Facebook page and, you know, just criticizing Jesus and the Bible and the church and this and that. And some of it is, is, is we deserve it as the church and as Christians. But I just considered this, this hour together. Just I told the leadership Wednesday night, I said, you pray. Pray for this meeting. And I'll tell you what, I came at him with facts, with, with logic, with, with a dialogue that all glory be to God caused him just to stop and just consider things. And there were times, multiple times in our conversation, he said, I, I don't know what to say. The wheels were turning. I thought there was a moment maybe his eyes were, were welling up with tears a little bit. But he just said, I just don't know what to say. And I just kept kind of pressing, you know, consider these things. And one of the things he talked about, because it moved from evil and suffering, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to devote an entire message to this question in a few weeks. Okay? So we know how to respond to a world that's going, what the hell is going on? Excuse my French. You guys didn't know that was French, did you? <laughs> my parents used to say, like, what, what are you talking about? That's not even French. Come on, Mom, Dad. Hello. Um, we shifted from that conversation, and he basically asked me a question. He goes, what's up with the cross of Jesus? Why is blood atonement necessary? Because it does seem like a crazy thing, doesn't it? There are some people who have written religious books and basically called the cross cosmic child abuse. There are people out there that would say, you don't need the cross. It's, it's worthless. And, it's not. and I said to this friend of mine, I said, here's why the cross is important. It's because we could never do what God has required us to do. And that is love Him. Why? Because there's, there's this thing called sin that stands in the way. And none of us are perfect. We make mistakes every single day. I said, you, and I pointed to him, I said, you as a husband and a father have failed in, in being a, a good husband and father today. A, not good, perfect. I have failed in being a perfect parent today. None of us do things perfectly, which then again points us to the reality that we need God. And here we have this intersection of God stepping in for man and taking upon himself the punishment we deserve, but he's going to take it for us and now forgive us of sins and extend to us righteousness so that we can begin the journey of living the life the way he wants us to live our lives. 
And so we talked about the beauty of the cross, not only where we in our imperfections and our sinfulness meet God, but it's where his justice and his kindness and his grace meet. And now you have this intersection of, of these things and it makes the cross glorious. And he's like, I've never heard that before. I've never considered this before. See, when you, when you operate with a crew of people that embrace the same worldview as you, you don't get to hear. Uh, just, you don't get to invo- be involved in a discussion. All you do, if you only watch Fox News, guess what? You think Trump's the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and yet if you watch the other news channels, you think he's the Antichrist, right? It's like, and if you just surround yourself with that thinking, yeah, guess what? Well, guess what? He's somewhere in between, right? Because now all of a sudden you take Fox and you take CNN and go, okay, he's an imperfect leader, right? But you know those kind of people that just surround themselves with like mind. God has, has not called us to uniformity. He's called us to unity. And that's why I consider it a great thing to sit with my atheist friend out there and us to have a discussion where even at the end we stand up and we say, I love you. I'm not there to save him. I'm not there to, to sell him on Jesus. I am there to share with him the truth. And I pray it's couched in grace. So you need to pray for my friend. I'm not going to mention his name. We're going live right now. He could be watching. But you know what? I love this guy. And I said, I look forward to more opportunities to talk. And I told him that in 32 years of walking with Jesus, all the facts and the evidence continue to just come out and just confirm what I believe is true. It's not because I want to believe these things. The, the evidence is irrefutable. And there is nothing that will ever be discovered archaeologically. There's nothing that will ever be discovered as far as old biblical manuscripts that will disprove what we have. Everything that comes forth corroborates what we have to be true. History has proved it. Archaeology proves it. The evidence is there. You can believe that Jesus was who he said he was and he did what he claimed to do. And that's why there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem right now. And the body of Jesus has yet to be put forward. Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic or is he Lord? And if he's Lord, and this is what I told my friend, then what it forces us to do is to be accountable and submissive submissive to him. And isn't that the reason why sometimes we wrestle out of the evidence that's put in front of us? Because we don't want to submit and we don't want to bow because we like to be God. Who likes to be God here? Who likes to call the shots? Who likes to be in control? Who just has a hard time submitting to a higher authority than you? Well, you need to eat more Hebrew national because they're accountable to a higher standard and higher authority, right? (laughs) Don't we need like that label on us? Like, I'm just like the Hebrew national kosher hot dog. We're accountable to a higher authority, right? Well, we are. As Christians, followers of Jesus, we are. And so there's history, okay? We can go on and on and on. Second point, what if, what's that? So, uh, second main point is this, evidence and the Trinity. So then what you have is you have a God that we worship, one God who makes himself in three persons. I always have to explain this, lest people go, you worship three gods? No, we don't worship three gods. We worship one God. It's called monotheism. But this God exists as a plurality, meaning he has made himself known in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, what's at center stage in John's argument here? The Son. But what you have is the corroboration of testimony coming not just from the Spirit, but from the Father. Look at verse 7. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. Well, now, just stop real quick. I'm going to link something for you. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the truth. Well, who's the truth, the Spirit or Jesus? Both. Why? Because we worship one God who's made himself in three persons. This basically is evidence of the deity of the Holy Spirit. One God, Jesus is also deity. Here's the linking between the two. So here's the Spirit who is the truth. Notice verse 8. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, the blood, and the three are in agreement. Remember what happened at the baptism? Not only did John baptize Jesus, but all of a sudden something came out of the heavens. What was it? The Spirit descending as a a dove, 
and the father saying, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. Corroboration. You have our stamp of approval. The son has come to accomplish the mission the father sent. And now the Spirit's going to apply that mission of Jesus to the hearts of those who would believe. Is the Spirit in, uh, integral to the work of God in this world? Yes. And so you have the Spirit bearing witness, giving testimony of what Jesus... And then you have the cross of Christ, right? And then you have this moment in where there is God working in this event, crying, you know, the, the Son crying out, It is finished. And the, the, the Father and the Spirit doing this incredible transaction of taking the sins of the world and Christ now suffering when he didn't have to because he was perfect for those that deserved to suffer and we didn't have to. He was our substitute. And so John says, these three are in agreement. The baptism of Christ signifying his inauguration of his ministry, the crucifixion of Christ uh, uh, regarding his consummating of his work, and the Spirit now basically says, yes, this is to be believed. These are true events. And now it is the Spirit's job to press these truths upon your heart to show you the reality of them. Because here's where unbelief will fight against what God's trying to show you. We can sit here and explain away the baptism, right? There are people that can explain away the deity of Christ and the, the cross of Christ, but it is the Spirit that bears these truths and applies them to the heart so that you realize at some point, wow, this really did happen. Apart from a work of the Spirit, belief is super, superfluous. How's that for a word? I used to say superfluous. Superfluous! No, it's not that. But here's, here's why I don't press, I present the evidence to my friend, my atheist friend, but I'm not bearing the burden of trying to save my friend. Why? Because that's only a work that the Spirit can do. And here's a, here's a pastoral note for you. If you have people in your life that are unbelievers, you're not going to debate them into the kingdom of God. If you have people in your life that don't know Jesus, you could preach at them until you're blue in the face. It's not going to change their heart. You may have people in your life who claim to know Jesus that may be walking in disobedience and not doing what God wants them to do. You love them, you pray for them, but you're not going to change them. Only God can do that. And can I tell you what a burden was lifted off my shoulders when I as a teenager tried to debate my dad into the kingdom of God? And I just realized God at that moment said, Scott, ease off the accelerator. You can't do this. You are not the Holy Spirit. Amen? There's one spirit, and it's his job to point us in the direction of truth. And that's what, just like a compass always points what direction? The spirit always points to Jesus. The spirit always. If you ever want to know if there's a work of God being done, here's the question you ask. Is it pointing to the glory and majesty of Christ? Because if it's not, then it's not a work of God. How's that? Is that good? If, if you want to know if something's really a, a, a work of God, if it celebrates, if it magnifies, if it, if it s- puts Christ front and center, that's what the Spirit does. John 14, John 16, the Spirit will bear witness of me, Jesus says. The Spirit will point to me. And so here is evidence, number one, under the Trinity, the Spirit. That when the counselor comes, John 15, it says this, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, he will testify about me. John 15. He's always pointing us to Jesus. Number two, the Father. I've already mentioned to you the, the work of the Father in the, in, the light, in the ministry of Jesus, his baptism, and, and this idea that, boy, the Father was always encouraging, you know, the Son was always trying to do the Father's will. He always did the Father's will, even in the garden. Remember, Jesus prays before the Father, if it be your will, let this cup of, of suffering pass. But he accepted it, not my will, but your will be done. There was this relationship between the Father and the Son taking place. And what you need to know in verse 9, look at what it says. If we receive this witness of men, that's one thing. But the witness of God is greater. Why? Men and women are fallible. God is infallible. 
Men and women are prone to be blind. God is not blind. Men and women tend to be liars. God is not a liar. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, right? So what we need to understand is that John brings into the courtroom the father who is always the final authority. He's always the final word. He's always the final say. So much so we could get to a point where Romans 3, Paul says, let every man be proved false and God proved to be true. If the whole world turned and said Christ is a liar, you as a follower believe the Father's testimony about the Son, and you may be swimming the, ro- the right direction, the wrong way, or whatever, however you want to put it, but you need to know if every man is a liar, in the end let God prove to be true. He is worthy to be trusted. And to reject Jesus as God's son is equivalent to charging God with perjury. Think about this. If everything Jesus did that he said he's come to to represent the Father, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. And yet God is nothing but a liar. This whole thing falls apart. But the evidence is there. The Trinity backs it up. And now the Father demands a response. And can I tell you, every single day we're alive, there's an opportunity for a response to be made. Can I tell you, I read this interesting article this week. So Christmas music. When did Christmas music start getting played on the radio? Summertime? It was just too early. Like, we're not even done with summer break yet. And, you know, we hear the chipmunk singing, Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa You're like, No! So research has been recently done that it is, it is research that employers, employees' productivity goes down when nonstop Christmas music is played. <laughs> Think about this. So this, this researcher came out and actually said that an employee's productivity goes down when Christmas music is playing nonstop because that employee gets to a point when they try not to hear what is being heard. (laughs) So here's the thing. I'm thinking about this. I'm going, I kind of feel the same way. Like, there's times I want to, like, drive my car off the side of the road and and be really unproductive then because of nonstop Christmas music playing, but just kidding. Um, Here's the thing. There's this message coming forth that we're familiar with, that we've been exposed to, And if inside of us we're trying to stop from hearing it, we're not really engaging with what's in front of us and what we need to be doing. Now let's translate this spiritually. Every day, creation testifies of God's existence. There is a music being played called creation where the heavens declare the glory of God. And yet we in our unbelief are trying to suppress the truth and unrighteousness, Romans chapter 1. And the more we suppress and don't submit, the more we try to brush it aside and not come to terms with this, the less productive we are as human beings. Here's the reality, guys. The evidence is continually bombarding us. What are you doing as far as response to it? Because... We can talk about rationality. We can talk about logic. We can talk about reason. And I'm going to tell you, all these things are in favor of what I'm presenting to you today, that the Son of God, Jesus, is to be believed. And to try to unhear what is being spoken and heard is counter to how you've been wired as a human being. You want to know why your marriage is a train wreck? You want to know why you can't hold down a job? You don't want to know why you battle with addiction? You want to know why you can't change the way you talk or act or behave? Fill in the blank. If you don't have Jesus, you're not going to be able to live the way God wants you to live. There's hope. And I'm not saying if you're an addict, you're you're out of the kingdom. I'm not going to say if you have a bad marriage, you're out of the kingdom. We all go through the trials of life. The question is, are you going to do it on your own steam? Are you going to lean on God who gives you the strength to get through it the way he wants you to get through it? That's the reality of it. So Christmas season is going to come and go. The Christmas music will eventually stop. Yes. But one thing that will not end 
is the constant declaration that there is a God and he loves you in Jesus. Will you come to terms with him and submit to his authority? There it is. My prayer is you believe. And if you want to have a sit down like I had with my atheist friend yesterday, I love that. Seriously, I was so eager to do that because why? There is a confidence in me that does not come from myself. It comes from the Spirit of God that says this is the truth. And when you know the truth, you can walk in freedom. And when you know the truth, you can walk in power. And when you know the truth, you can walk with joy and hope. And there's nothing anyone could ever say to me that's going to dislodge the hope and the joy I have in Christ. Amen? So evidence in history, evidence and the Trinity. The last thing, evidence and the believer. And this is where it gets personal, and we're going to go through this fairly quickly. Got about five, ten minutes. Look at verse 10. Because there's three things I want to point out here that are also important. Because I'm not just talking theory. I'm not just talking head knowledge about Christ. Here's the beautiful thing in how you're wired as a human being. He's created you with feelings and emotions and to, to have experiences. We don't, we're not led by our feelings and our experiences and hope that those things validate truth. We pursue truth and allow that truth then to validate our feelings and our emotions and our experiences. So here's where the heart comes in. There's the head, there's the heart. Look what John says, verse 10. The one who believes, point number one, the initiation of life. The Bible says if you're without Christ, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, Ephesians chapter 2. But Christ came to bring a dead world life. People are living, but in reality, they're the walking dead. The reality of it is we live in a world that basically is not far off from George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. (sighs) Right? If we had spiritual eyes, I see dead people. If we had spiritual eyes, we would see people walking walking around who are dead in their trespasses and sins. And this is the crazy thing about the matrix until you get plugged into Jesus, go down the rabbit hole, then you get to see the way life truly is. How many more movie references can I throw out there? (laughs) this This is the amazing thing about fiction. Fiction points to the spiritual realities that we proclaim. People wonder why we live in a world where there's gonna continue to be mass shootings Because people are dead in their trespasses and sins. People don't want to submit to God. See, Christ came to wake us out of our slumber, to create in us a heart that is alive, not a, a heart that's dead. And he came to give us life. And that's why Ephesians 2 says, but God makes us alive in Christ. So John says in verse 10, That when you believe in the Son of God, there's when life begins. You are born again. We're all born into this world, natural born sinners. Every single person is not merely sick. We are dead, but only God can make us alive in Christ. We're not mostly dead. Last one, I promise. We are dead. There's nothing we can do. Outside an outward act of God changing the stone cold dead heart. And now in Christ, he makes it alive. So John says, here's where we start. Life begins when you believe in Christ and he changes your spiritual disposition. He awakens you from deadness. He gives you life. And so here's the, qual- here's the uh, uh, initiation of life. The one who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. The one who does not believe God has basically made him a liar because he has not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning his Son. Number two. Verse 11, John says, not only have you had life now given to you by God as a gift, eternal life, That has nothing to do just with your future state. 
but it has to do with your current quality of life. Look at verse 11. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, and he who has the Son has the life. Meaning, right now, you have the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. What does this mean? This means that because of Jesus, when you come to the point of believing, and he starts life in you, that quality of life changes from that moment on. You merely are not this thing in eternity, 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 even though we're happy about heaven. And we're excited to be with, with Christ in that unbroken fellowship and relationship to be freed from this world that is still saturated by sin. There's a quality of life Jesus gives you now so that you begin to not only live distinctively in a culture that doesn't understand the ways of Jesus, but you inside, by the Spirit, get to become a different person right here, right now. It's where the fruit of the Spirit come into play. Galatians chapter 5. You begin to be a more loving person, a more joyful person, a more patient person, a more kind person, a more compassionate person, a more gentle person, a more fill-in-the-blank person. Right? When Jesus takes over, people will see that you are different. And you tell me, you can't tell me that when God shows up, he doesn't make a change in you. He does. Now, all of us change at different, different speeds. Amen? I mean, we go hike a camelback. There's some that get the camelback in five minutes up to the top. And there's some of you, it's like five days, right? Amen? We, but we're all on the journey. We're all on the journey. We're on the same mountain. We've got the same goal. It's just some of us grow differently. But the question is, there's got to be growth, period. There's got to be movement. And that movement, that growth is not dependent upon you because at the end of the day, you don't want to take credit for anything. You want to chalk it up to God and His work through His Spirit in you. The quality of your life changes. This is a big word in theology and we talk about it's called sanctification. You're being made more like Christ. You're being conformed, Romans 8, to the image of Jesus. And if you're scratching your head because you have been saying, I'm a Christian, and five years later you're no different than you were five years ago, you have believed in a false gospel. You have not believed in the true Christ. It is time for you to believe today. Amen? I have no problem saying that. Because I love you so much, I don't want to let you leave with a false security. When God shows up, He changes people. Now, the speed of the change, the rate of the change, that's up to him. But you will see change because the Spirit brings every believer into conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. Sh- initiation of life, quality of life, eternal life now. Imagine that. We get to daily taste the, 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 the glory that's to come. The outer man is, is decaying, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I, that's an awesome passage. Right? that we consider the momentary light affliction that we experience on a day-to-day basis nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. There's an old saint, Saint Teresa of Avila. She's awesome. She said this, what we will find is that the deepest struggles and the hardest trials in this world, when we get to eternity with Jesus, will be nothing more than spending a night at a very dirty, inconvenient hotel. That's awesome, right? So, eternal life now, and yet eternal life to come. Which brings us to our last point, assurance of life. And I really don't need to say anything more than what's already been said. Verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, meaning the totality of who Jesus is, what He has done, in order that you may know, that you may be confident, that you may be certain, that you are assured that you have eternal life. Do you know today? Because I can't assume all of you do. Because there's this thing that creeps into our lives called doubt. Has anyone ever doubted? It's okay. You need to know that doubting is not the unforgivable sin. But I'm going to ask you right now, 
Because John doesn't want us to doubt. He wants us to move through doubt. He wants us to enter in the realm of confidence. Because doubt just, it arrests our spiritual growth. It robs us of joy. It cripples our usefulness. Here's the question. Why do we doubt? And I'm going to draw this out of what we've already read in 1 John. Four things of why we doubt. Number one, because we are ignorant of God's word and his promises. The enemy loves it if he can keep you busy from, from looking at God's w- word to you. The enemy loves it when you're just binge watching Stranger Things and you're not binge reading the Psalms. The enemy loves it because Stranger Things, as much as the show is good and we're all rooting for 11 and all that good stuff, Stranger Things does not give you the promises your soul needs. This contains the promises of God that are fuel for your hope, that is food for your joy. The enemy loves it when you're too busy for this. Number two, we doubt because of faulty theology. Some of us believe we can lose our salvation. What a lie that is. Because if you're constantly walking in the realm of, oh, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. He lo- Who wants that? That was junior high love affairs in my life. Who wants that? You need to know God loves you. And according to John 10, there is nothing that could ever snatch you from the Father's hand. You are eternally secure in Christ. Romans 8 If God is for us, who can be against us? Here's the promises that do away with faulty theology. Some of you are horrible theologians and you need to get right in this area because what you believe will affect how you behave. What you know is going to impact how you, uh, your attitudes and your prayers and your, your actions. This is why... We put a premium on good theology, not so that we can be in our ivory towers and be like, I know all these Bible verses. No, because it translates to really a powerful heart affections for God. Number three, we doubt because of disobedience. Some of us are not doing what God wants us to do, and we know it. And I'm lovingly calling you out of your sin back to a place where you can stand before him and you're not ashamed to to be before him. You've been bought with a price, and now you are called, according to Ephesians 4, to walk in a manner worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus. Do it. Disobedience clouties the waters of what God is trying to say to you. It is ruining the glasses. You know, sometimes I don't know. I I pick up a pair of my wife's sunglasses, and it's so caked with makeup and lipstick and kids. I'm like, how do you see through these things? Like, I'm like, I, I'm like, maybe I'm just like OCD. My sunglasses, like, always polished, right? I go, she's like, oh, I'm driving in her car, and I don't have my sunglasses. I'm like, let me use yours. I'm like, how do you even see through these things? God says, I know, right? Like, she takes it and just rubs it all over or something. God sits there and says the same thing. How do you see a God who wants to be seen through the disobedience of your lives? God rewards those who seek him, and he's a God who says, you want to be pure? Well, in your purity, you're going to see me. Walk in obedience. Then doubt will be done away with. Last thing is, some of us have yet to do battle with the hate that dwells in our hearts. John's confronted us with a message of love. He says, you don't, you don't love God and hate your brother. That, that, that's a total spiritual disconnect. You've got to do something about the hate and anger within. And you know what? When you understand how much we hated God and yet He loved us, and now He's arrested our hearts and shown us a love beyond anything we could ever imagine, how dare you continue to hold on to ha- hate and anger when you've been called to love? That doesn't mean all your relationships are perfect. That doesn't mean you're not called to still reconcile and forgive. And that's really the key. You've got to forgive. You've got to love with no strings attached, and you've got to forgive like you've been forgiven in Christ. Amen? Let me close with a funny story I heard this week, because I know all of you are uh, big Puff Daddy fans. Who's Puff Daddy fans out there? Okay, I thought so. So 
Uh, I'm more Chance the Rapper. I really like Chance the Rapper, but Puff Daddy. So, you know, wh wh what do we call him? Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Sean Combs? I mean, what is it? Well, if you haven't heard, he's changed his name once again. This week, Puff Daddy, Sean Combs, P. Diddy came out and said, I don't want you to call me any of those things. My new name is Love, a.k.a. Brother Love. No, really, he said this. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you say that, and what's it going to be next week, or what's it going to be next year? And my thought is, wow, what a cool name, right, to call yourself Love or Brother Love. Like, don't call me Scott, I'm now Brother Love. Like, woo! I'm going to tell you right now, guys, I, I don't care what you change your name to, but all I know is the name of Jesus, if you're going to call yourself by that name, meaning Christian, I don't care what your name is. What I care is what are your actions and what are your behaviors and what are your attitudes model? See, P. Diddy, Sean Combs, Puff Daddy, a.k.a. Brother Love, whatever you want to call yourself, if you're really going to embody love, then I don't want to necessarily see it in a name change, and I don't want to hear it in your angry lyrics. I want to see it in your life. Call yourself Christian? Guess what? I don't care what you call yourself. What I'm watching is your actions, just like you're watching mine. So Brother Love, Brother Sister, Sister Love, Sister Brother Love, whatever you want to call it, we are in this together. And we're doing it for the glory of God because what Jesus has done for us. Amen? So let's go out with power. Let's go out with assurance. Let's go out with confidence. God is worthy to be served. He's worthy to be honored in our lives. Let's pray. Stand up if you would with me. Oh, Father, it is good to be together with your people. It is good to be together in this place where we are willingly just laying our hearts and minds open before you. And, and I know that the power of an open mind is to close those minds on something solid. And my prayer is that today we have been given that through your word and your truth. That we as your people who are called by your name and those of us who would say, yes, we associate with Jesus, would be the most confident and assured people. Because the evidence is clear, the testimony is there, it is irrefutable. Christ is not only worthy to be believed in, he is worthy to be worshipped and followed. And I pray that would be true of our lives today and forever. So thank you for this morning, chance to be together, and we just want to declare once again, you are an awesome God. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Make it a point to meet someone you've never met before, all right? God bless you guys. Have a great week.